hopefully this will be the uh, least data-driven talk of our afternoon, just because uh, I don't think there are any good uh, trials comparing the different devices. So I'm going to uh, deliver my impressions of the currently FDA-approved devices. Uh, the uh, first reported series of, uh, thoracic, of thoracic aortic aneurysm uh, treatment by Stentcraft was in 1994 by Dake and colleagues. Um, and it took almost 19 years for uh, us to progress from the first report to an FDA-approved device, which is really significantly longer than what we saw in the infrarenal device. And um, at present, there are only five approved devices from four manufacturers, and I think there's some factors that go into why it took so much longer. Um, when you compare the thoracic versus the infrarenal uh, aorta for the treatment of aneurysm disease, uh, there are uh, more uh, engineering concerns in the thoracic aorta. There's greater he hemodynamic forces. Uh, applied to the uh, uh, stent graft and thoracic aorta because of increased flow. Uh, there is significant angulation at the seal zones, uh, which you would not accept in the infrarenal aorta. Uh, and so there's obligate force applied to the device. Uh, the devices are larger. Uh, the delivery systems are longer, and so there's more strain on the, on the delivery system. And uh, in uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm disease, you have a much higher prevalence of uh, women patients with smaller access vessels. And so all these factors increase the technical challenge of delivering a device to the thoracic aorta and uh, uh, treating it. Uh, another factor is that the uh, diseases that we treat with thoracic, it's, it's sort of a one-size-fits-all solution, but the diseases are very diverse, unlike in the infrarenal aorta where the overwhelming majority is purely for fuseform aneurysms. Uh, in the thoracic aorta, we treat uh, uh, fuseform aneurysms. Uh, currently, probably the most common indication for treatment is for acute aortic syndrome uh, with type B dissections, penetrating ulcers, and intramural hematoma. And we also use these devices in the setting of traumatic transections, where you have a normal aorta, you have a disruption of the aorta, and a normal, normal aorta distally. And so you're asking the same device to treat very different uh, uh, pathology. Um, and the choice of device and the uh, choice of oversizing, really, the, 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 the indication has some implications uh, with regard to that. Um, you know, Dr. Mehta talked about the risk of type A dissections uh, when treating type B, uh, uh, type, progression type A, and that may have some association with bare stents approximately. There are, there are other concerns in terms of oversizing, and so I'll talk about the different devices. But, um, so when you talk about stent grafts in general, you want to talk about both the graft and the delivery system. Uh, the graft is how it's going to behave once you get it there, and so you look at the stent, the, the fabric that it's, that it's made of. Uh, fixation, whether it's active fixation or whether it's purely by oversizing, and the conformability to the aorta. And you also want to look at the delivery system because uh, the majority of acute complications, particularly around the time of uh, uh, implantation, are related to uh, passing device through the iliacs. Uh, and so uh, aspects of uh, profile, trackability, and the precision of deployment are important. Um, and when it comes to the thoracic aorta, particularly when you have to go around the bend, there's always a concern about this concept of bird beaking. The, uh, uh, along the lesser curvature, uh, the device uh, uh, may not conform as well as you'd like, um, and an acute angulation is, is, is built into the device. And so you'll see most of the current iterations of devices, independent of their deployment system, have some mechanism to allow for alignment of the proximal stent in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, thoracic aorta. So we'll talk about five devices, um, and I'm going to talk about them in their order of their approval. Uh, so we'll talk about the Gora C-Tag, the Zenith TX2, the Valiant Captivia, Bolton Relay, and then most recently the Alpha Thoracic. And then I'll talk a little bit about the upcoming technology. And so Gore was the first device that was approved for uh, uh, um, commercial use in the United States. Uh, it was initially approved in 2005. Um, the current iteration is the conformable graft, which was approved in 2011. Uh, it is a PTFE graft with a, a single uh, sinusoidal nitinol wire wrapped around it. Um, the uh, current iteration was developed because the, the original device worked well, but in cases where there was significant oversizing or in traumatic transections where there was a fair amount of angulation, there was a concern with collapse. And so uh, they made some adjustments in terms of the attachment of the sinusoidal stent to the, to the fabric and uh, in terms of the proximal aspect of the, uh, the stent graft uh, to allow for um, uh, tolerance uh, within acute angulation. Uh, the Gore device is unlike the others in terms of the deployment in that it's got a, 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 a suture uh, that's, control, that's attached to a membrane wrapped around the device. And so it's a ripcord, a mechanism of deployment. You pull it, it deploys from the middle out uh, to allow for some uh, precision in placement. But it's probably, uh, it could be the, potentially one of the more challenging devices to deliver. Um, it is relatively simple. Uh, it treats uh, from 21 to 45 millimeter diameter uh, devices, and so it's indicated, I think, up to 42 millimeters uh, 
and it requires a, se a separate sheath. So the largest device requires a 24 French sheath, and so the OD of the uh, Gore dry seal is probably around 26. The uh, TX2 is a Zenith device. This, the, t the Proform is a second generation device. So the original device was uh, deployed with a simple pin and pull device. This is a uh, um, device that was approved in 2008. It's composed of stainless steel nitinol Z st stainless steel Z stents. There is active proximal fixation with barbs, and it's a uh, uh, Dacron fabric. Um, the Proform modification is, is a modification in the delivery system. So they have a curved cannula to allow it to tolerate the uh, uh, bending in the arch. And there was a restraining wire that uh, constrained the proximal stent to uh, facilitate alignment of the proximal uh, uh, stent. So it would, uh, you'd retract the sheath and then release the constraining wire at the end. Um, it treats up to, it comes in up to 42 millimeters in diameter. They're both straight and tapered devices. And the sheath size of the delivery catheter is 22 to 20, 20 to 22 French ID. So the OD is about 20 to 25 French. So it's a fairly large device. Um, it's durable. You just have to be able to get it to where you need to go. The Valiant Captivia thoracic stent graft is, is a, a really a third generation device. It was approved in uh, 2011, um, and it received this indication for the treatment of type B dissections in 2014. So this is, a progr this is an evolution from Medtronic's original device, which was a talent device that they had bought from World Medical. It's, uh, it's a, uh, made of nitinol Z stents and Dacron fabric. Uh, of note, there is no supporting bar. So this is designed to uh, tolerate more torturous anatomy than the talent did. Um, and it comes in longer lengths. So the talent was available in up to 10 centimeters. So this comes in up to 20 centimeters. Uh, the proximal extent is a, is a free flow device, so there's bare stent, and the distal device is, is flush. Um, the delivery system has a, uh, a constraining mechanism, so the top stents are, are uh, constrained until the device is ready to be completely deployed. And again, this assists with uh, alignment, and it's designed to help prevent distal migration during deployment. It's got a hydrophilic delivery system that does not require an extra, extra sheath, and so the OD is anywhere from 22 to 25 French. Um, and if this device looks similar, this is a Bolton Relay Plus, and so the people who were at World Medical who sold talent to Medtronic went off and made another company, and they came up with a stent graft, which is uh, fairly similar. Again, um, this is almost like uh, in evolution homology. I think a lot of the devices are starting to adopt some of the similar, similar uh, characteristics, because. Uh, uh, the proof of concept is that they work. This was approved in 2012, and this device, again, is comprised of nitinol Z stents with a Dacron fabric. This does have a bar, but it's not involving the proximal two uh, stents, and it's sinusoidal in shape, so it allows for some columnar strength, but still allows for the device to um, tolerate bends. Uh, they have a proximal clasp with a bare stent, and this is, again, to allow for alignment uh, and prevent distal migration during deployment. One of the things that's different about this system than others is that it's got dual sheath systems. So there's an outer uh, stiff sheath and then an inner flexible sheath. And so once you get the device through the iliac arteries, uh, you advance it with just the flexible sheath. Is, the idea is to allow it to tolerate a little bit more tortuosity during delivery. Um, it comes in a uh, anywhere from a 22 to 46 millimeter graft. It is a fairly large device. The largest one is 26 French. And so I think that's the biggest delivery system amongst the, that's out there. And then the most recent uh, device that's approved is the uh, Alpha Thoracic. This was approved in uh, 2015, and so it's an adaptation of the, of the uh, Zenith TX2 platform, but they built it off of a nitinol uh, stent-based uh, uh, design. And so it's nitinol Z stents instead of uh, stainless steel allows for a slightly lower profile. Uh, they also have uh, a proximal bare stent and barb, so it has active fixation, unlike uh, some of the previous devices we've made. The only one is the TX2, which has that. Um, the delivery system has a pre-curved cannula, and in the larger devices, they have the proform restraining wires that we mentioned in the TX2 uh, to allow for alignment as well. Uh, and this device is, is significantly smaller. The uh, sheath size is anywhere from 16 to 20 French ID, um, and so the OD is 18 to 22 French. Uh, and you can see here, this is the pre-curved cannula with the restraining of the uh, bare stents during deployment. Uh, I'll just talk about something that's coming down the pipe. Um, there are, Cook has a, uh, branched and fenestrated devices. They've got an off-the-shelf T-branch, which is currently uh, being investigated. Um, Medtronic has two uh, devices that are being considered uh, to extend the applicability. There's the uh, Mona Lisa, which is a uh, device with a, which, a, which has a single branch for the subclavian. And then uh, they've got a, a device with a manifold, which is being designed for uh, thoracobdominal uh, aneurysms. And again, this is investigational. Uh, and Gore has uh, two similar platforms. They've got a um, 
a device with a left subclavian branch with an internal branch and a dedicated uh, branch component, and they also have TAMBI, which is a, a four-vessel thoracoabdominal graft. And the relay has an arch device, which has two internal branches uh, with, uh, uh, so you can uh, revascularize this, uh, the brachiocephalic uh, vessels. So just in conclusion, uh, we're currently on uh, second or third generation devices. Uh, this has led to uh, significant improvements in profile and deployment precision. Uh, the choice of the device really depends on operator comfort. I think that uh, they all uh, treat the majority of disease relatively well, and there are certain nuances that uh, uh, predispose you in one or the other. Um, and the future is there are a number of branch devices which are currently in trials, but uh, hopefully uh, they'll come available widely soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.